So uh, I see people are still filing in, but I think it's a, it's a great time as any to start. Um, very special thanks to uh, Tony Bukanfusa from the UIDP uh, who uh, agreed to lead this panel uh, on industry academic collaborations, which uh, in relation to non dilutive funding, of course, which we at Freemind uh, value greatly. Uh, personal, well, personal uh, uh, organizational note, uh, whenever we conduct an assessment for, for a company, we always ask them or try to source where they, where they can implement such collaborations, understanding that uh, if they have any gaps in their capabilities or expertise, filling those gaps with academic uh, collaborator is definitely the way to go in order to maximize their chances for award. So I'm sure all these guys over here are going to touch upon that and, and, and share much more than uh, what I, I just did. So I'd uh, just like to introduce uh, Tony. Uh, he's the executive director of the University Industry Demonstration Partnership, UIDP. Uh, he served as the National Academy's UIDP executive director since 2007. He's a leading expert on high-value, high-return university industry partnerships who works with other thought leaders from academic and corporate communities to advance these collaborations and promote the nation's economic competitiveness. In his current role, he spearheads the development of a series of initiatives to catalyze partnerships and reduce barriers to industry and uh, academic uh, collaborations. Tony holds a PhD in inorganic chemistry, definitely my favorite undergrad course, uh, from the <laughs> University of yeah. South Carolina and earned his uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and Political Science from Foreman University. Uh, without further ado, uh, all yours. Okay, great, thank you. Well, thank you uh, for that kind introduction and uh, I look forward to hearing the comments of the fellow panelists who are gonna give you kind of some real world perspectives on how they've used non-dilutive funding uh, to advance their corporate missions and attain resources to help them be successful. So I was asked uh, by the FreeMind team to maybe give some overview comments on the state of university and industry relationships and maybe put some things into context. Uh, and I'm pleased to do that. I, I just want to give one quick disclaimer that these comments are mine and mine alone and don't necessarily reflect those of the National Academies or, or the organization that I represent. So um, I do think it's so fitting. We're, we're in San Francisco. and I. I I, I'm not very funny, I don't tell a lot of jokes, so at least my kids tell me I'm not very funny, but um, I came to one of these meetings several years ago and I noticed nobody was wearing ties. None of the VC guys were wearing ties. And so, you know, I'm on East Coast, Washington, we wear ties, right, all the time. And so I went up to this VC guy right after the, the presentation, I said, I got a question for you. How come you VC guys don't wear ties? You know, is it like part of the uniform? And he goes, Tony, we wear ties when we ask people for money. So, I'm not wearing a tie today, so you all are in good shape. So. All right, so I'm gonna introduce all of the panelists uh, as they come up individually. We're gonna do this alphabetically. Uh, it's a great group of folks. I've had a chance to look through the, the presentations, and you'll see kind of a richness and a diversity in terms of their experiences. Um, like I, like I, I mentioned just a minute ago, though, I'm gonna give you some context, I think, to university and industry collaborations. Um, just, just do a quick show of hands. How many of you all are from companies, from companies, companies? And how many of you have had an act, have right now an active university collaboration? Okay, so about half, okay. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. That's the focus of this panel. And we're gonna leave lots of time for uh, Q&A at the end, okay? All right, so first, the group that I represent is the University Industry Demonstration Partnership. We're a membership organization of mostly large companies and mostly large universities, and we focus on trying to identify ways to make it easier to work together. For those of you who've worked with universities that come from the corporate sector, you know there can be some challenges to that. And I'm not here to do a promo on the UIDP, but I'll be pleased to, to talk to you about um, some of our activities if, if you're interested. I did bring some propaganda, though, and I'll, I'll leave that with you if you all would like that. Um, okay, so wh what are the issues that I see affecting university industry collaborations as of today. So let me just put a couple things in context that you may or may not know. For a large research university, somewhere between five and 10% of their R&D funding comes from industry. Now, if they have an academic medical center and they do clinical trials, it might be different than if they're a land-grant school. 
But for a university like Michigan, I know someone mentioned Michigan before, it's a billion dollar research enterprise. Somewhere between 60 and 100 million dollars is a typical number that you would see coming from industry. That pays for a lot of postdocs, a lot of grad students, a lot of travel, et cetera. Interestingly though, and this really is, I think, occurred a little bit more now with the sequestration and people saying, oh my God, federal funding is going to go down. We have to get more funding from industry. Industry spends a relatively small percent of their funding externally. So if a company like DuPont spends $5 billion a year on research, externally they're only spending about $50 million or 1% of that. And that could be national labs, small companies, or universities. <laughs> What we do know about small companies is what? Most small companies that have gotten funding from them have an academic partner. Okay, and here's just some survey that was done by The Economist looking at trends. And we certainly in the life science space, there's no such thing as reaching an equilibrium. It's probably the biggest frustration that I have is that the life science sector is continually evolving. So their long-term strategy is a three-month strategy, not a a three-year strategy, and it makes it very difficult for you or a university to partner with them. But the trends indicate that more companies are looking to partner. I think we certainly are seeing that in the life science space. If you haven't seen this, this is uh, Battelle's most recent global R&D funding forecast. This is available as a PDF online. Um, this is my only print copy, so I'm not going to give it to you. Um, and I don't know how you can get this. They, they were just kind enough to send it to me. But it is available as a PDF on, online. And, if you want to know about global trends in terms of in industries and what's going on around the world, you might want to look at this. Okay, so what are the, what are the main issues affecting collaborations? Because in theory, everybody likes the idea of collaborations, right? But, but what, are the, what are the issues that we see? Well, IP still comes up as the number one issue, both foreground and background. And we could have a whole session devoted about managing IP in university industry collaborations. But that's, that's not the only thing we're going to talk about. But that kind of weaves its way through most of what we're going to talk about today. Contracting is a big problem. It still takes too long. Uh, compliance issues, conflict of interest, we read about those all the time. Uh, the process, uh, there are too many people, especially at the university side, that can tell you no. You need to find somebody who can tell you yes. There are lots and lots of competing interests. Most companies want to partner with universities to gain access to intellectual capital. They're not looking to be a long-term strategic partner. Faculty will triangulate companies and university administration. So they have their own agendas, um, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, and they're gonna focus on their inherent self-interests. So you need to keep that in mind when you partner with universities in that you're dealing with a researcher who also may wanna create a startup, right? I don't know if that's happened to any of you all, but we can talk about those stories, right? That happening. And then there are a lot of people at universities who think they, who will say they represent the university and tell you they want to work with you. Um, and they may not actually be in an office that can get you access to the right people. All right, I, I put this slide up here because I think it's, it's a good contextual slide. It talks about, this is from Randy Gushel, who used to head external collaborations for uh, DuPont out of Wilmington. Um, this is what DuPont has used traditionally to talk about their university partners. So they, they look at things like rankings and faculty strength. So that's a very dispassionate approach. They look at geography. So sometimes I'll hear of a university from, you know, let's say a university in the, in the Midwest that's not near a, a major research hub say, well, how, how am I going to partner with this big company? Um, if they have a facility close by, you might be able to actually work with them because they don't always need the world's best scientist or engineer to partner. So geography is important. Um, successful alumni matter. So if you're, if you're at a company and you have a lot of graduates from Penn State and you're in Utah, you're going to wind up working a lot with Penn State, right? Because it, it validates your, your greatness. So I mean, think about it. Um, demographics matter to DuPont. They care about success in recruiting. So if you're a small company and you've recruited people from a university, you're going to go back to them to recruit and also to do work because you've built some level of trust, right? And then prior success in research collaborations. 
So success breeds success. All right, so, so what are some of the current trends that I see out there now? Universities are falling all over themselves trying to figure out new approaches to industry engagement because they've been told, one, that they're not very friendly to work with, two, they're too costly, third, they're arrogant. And I could add about 10 more things. I don't necessarily agree with all those, but that's what the public's perception is. So universities are trying to find new ways to do this. A lot of them are creating one-stop shops for small companies and large companies to gain access to the university. The government, and I know you just heard from uh, Larry to NHLBI, the government is trying to figure out ways to partner universities and companies without us having an industrial policy. And the states are really doing some really neat things. So um, you can look at Ohio and the Third Frontier program, I think is a great example um, of, of a state that's done. And California has traditionally had a strong industrial program that partners universities with companies. So there's a lot of interesting things going on at the state level and also at the federal level. Companies different, different how they approach engagement with universities. And I'll mention Intel. Intel doesn't care a lot about patents. They just want to make sure they have freedom to practice. That's not very common in the life sciences, but different industries have different approaches. And then small businesses really work at the, the nexus of partnering with large companies who they're worried about stealing their technology, right? and universities who they're worried about bleeding out their intellectual capital, their platform technology. So it, it's kind of a, a challenge working at that small business space when you're trying to partner with large companies and universities. So here are just a few things that are out there that I would point out that US universities are doing. They're aware that they need to be better to partner with, with companies, both large and small. Um, and there's lots of examples, and these are just a few of them. You can Google any of these things that I put up. and you can find out information, or if you want information, I'll, I'll give you my card after and be pleased to chat with you. But what I'm trying to show here is that universities are doing things. They're not just sitting there. They're trying to figure out better ways to partner with you. OK, so just maybe as I wrap this up, and then you can hear some specific examples from, uh, from my colleagues on the panel here. Um, these are, I think, just a few important steps when you think about collaboration. One is make sure you make contact with the right person at the university. So I will give you my bias. I think the associate deans of research might be the most important people for small companies. And the reason I say that is associate deans have one foot in administration, but they also have one foot in the labs. So they know what's going on in the labs, right? And that's important because you need that balance. You need people who understand both sides. And look, there are lots of other people with different titles that can help you, but that was just something I, I would point out. Um, you need to think about negotiating an agreement, and if you don't have expertise in that, find people who can help you do that. Um, when I was at a university overseeing research administration, we would write a lot of the contracts to work with small companies, leverage that. Um, they're, not all universities are trying to exploit you. Um, and then you can take something and then give it to somebody else to review if that would, that would help you. You need to really be careful about managing projects and expectations. Universities work on a different time frame than you all, and they work under best effort. They don't do, you know, they don't give a deliverable, you know, a material. Um, so you need to think about that. Um, we did my group at the at the National Academies. We put together a whole whole survey on different things you need to think about when managing expectations and how to build these contacts. I think I have enough of these. I'll, I'll pass them out um, at some point here. And then uh, you need to think about, are you going to do a one-off project or do you need a, maybe piece of a, an access to a piece of equipment one time versus are you looking to partner with a local university or nationally ranked university or somebody who's very good at what you do to have a longer term strategic engagement? Because you come at them in different ways. Right? So maybe once a quarter you need access to a certain piece of equipment. Okay? The university might have a charge structure for that. You'll go over, you'll give them your sample, they'll run it, you'll take it back, and you won't see them again to the next quarter. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's a lot different than saying, we're a startup company, we have limited resources, we have a platform technology that we think is really going to be successful. Can you partner with us to help make this successful? And that's a totally different approach than what the, the former example that I just gave. All right, and then obviously, 
small and mid-sized companies have a lot different set of issues than large companies. All right, I, I'm gonna, this is my kind of wrap-up slide. HP um, tried to identify all the var various ways that they partner with universities. And they came up with this university industry partnership continuum, which talks about things that you can do that are pretty easy, like going to career fairs or hiring interns, all the way through to lobbying at the federal, at the federal or state level. Okay? All universities, let's see if this works. Does this work? No, it works. All universities want to be in that top right quadrant, or you know, they want to be farther along. They all want to get a lot of funding from you. They want you to have labs in their university, et cetera. You have to walk though before you can run. And, and the point of this slide is just to point out there's a lot of things you can do with universities in addition to R&D, in addition to having strategic collaboration. You know, you might be a small, a small company that needs help with a website or marketing, and a university can be really helpful to you in that regard, right? So there are lots of ways to partner with universities in addition to R&D, and, and I just would like to leave that thought with you. We've done some work on this as well, and I, we have some publications I'll be pleased to, to share with you if you'd like. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first panelist who I'm going to introduce, and then we'll go from there. Okay. I'll introduce you. Follow the rules. All right. Here we go. Uh, Dr. Timothy Antaya is currently founder and president of Ionex, Ionetics Corporation and possesses three decades of technical experience and scientific leadership in research organizations and companies involved in the development of large scale electromagnetic devices for basic science and related commercial applications. At Ionetics, the future of medicine and security is being advanced using advanced particle accelerators. And Dr. Antaya has a PhD in accelerator physics from Michigan State, sorry for the reference to Michigan, which was awarded in 1984. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Antaya. All right, Tony, thank you. Um, uh, by the way, the his set of slides were uh, really excellent. Uh, I thought he captured um, all of the issues really well. And I would just add that this notion uh, that you uh, approach an uh, associate dean, I think, is a good one because, one, it's part of their mission statement to do collaborations. And the second is they have enough decision-making power within a university to actually um, get you access to a particular research facility or research group, so I, I thought that was good. All right, um, one step beyond Ionetics, uh, so, uh, which has just recently happened. Um, uh, for a living, I design particle accelerators, all right, and uh, they're used in basic science, medicine, and security. Um, it's historically work that's really done at universities and national labs. It's not something that a company does because it's, it's so expensive. Um, I, but I've done this at universities, uh, Michigan State and MIT, uh, a national lab, a Fortune 500 company where I was the technical design chief, and a private equity startup that you just heard about, Ionetics. Um, and I've participated in, built teams for, planned projects for, and executed research, uh, often in a lead role, uh, you know, basic research uh, of order of a billion dollars over, over my career, including large projects like the, the ITER uh, project that's now being built in Catarash. Uh, and I've been the PI on NSF, DOE, DOD, and NIH research contracts, uh, you know, sprinkled across all of these different organizations. Um, but now um, I'm doing something new and um, uh, sponsored research with uh, federal agencies is an important part of it, uh, which I'll try to explain by maybe treating uh, my new company as a case study. All right, so uh, you're now, I've taken the design and analysis and proof of concept assets of Inetics private as a wholly owned LLC with one member, me. Uh, and why have I done that? Uh, well, um, I, I, I like to be at the technology edge. I, like, I just do new things for a living. And uh, you know, when it's ready for commercialization, you don't need me. 
Um, doing new things is hard. Uh, you need uh, a small, and, and even if you did them, you do them in a medium or a large size company, or even within a university or a national lab. You need a small, flat, light organization with a really high-end team, uh, and then you've got to have methods that match that team, not methods that match the larger organization, and a highly optimized infrastructure, which usually means a, a lot more computational resources and, and maybe some very specialized test equipment. Um, but doing new things requires uh, you know, making hard decisions. And I finally decided that 100% you know, ownership uh, position allows me to make those decisions as I see uh, best uh, without having to uh, explain or justify them uh, to others. And that allows us to move quickly in a new direction so I'd say we have a plan, but sometimes the plan's awful, so you have to change it. And, and other times along the way you encounter new things and you really ought to stop and, and, and chase those as well. Uh, but it's a very expensive business. All right, so the, the business model uh, is uh, really that it's absolutely essential that I keep this small team, this high-end productive team, uh, which means that we're not going to put up production facilities. And we're not going to uh, do the, um, you know, the, the product commercialization, although we could. We've done that. Uh, all right, so it's a co-development with strategic partners that understand the, the high-end nature of what we're doing and its risk and also the benefit to uh, uh, their business. Uh, licensing, so for example, four commercial companies already uh, exist out there based on uh, intellectual property which I or my teams have developed. Um, joint ventures with manufacturing partners. Um, you know, this keeps the, the core team, again, small and focused. Um, and, um, you know, we sort of, uh, let's see. Um, all right, so now, where does, where does uh, sponsored research come in? Um, all right, so um, I've been, you know, on, on both sides of it in, in, in multiple organizations. And so I'm, I now want to look, uh, so we're uh, at, uh, I want to look at it from um, the, the agency side. So, and there's a small error in the slide, it should be SBIRs, STTR programs. So this is where um, a group of our size can, can uh, fit. Uh, however, these programs are essentially a tax on the research budgets at the government agencies. So they have a certain research portfolio, they have certain mission goals, and then some fraction of that, uh, a few percent, has to go to SBIRs and STTRs. And, and so then it, it means that if you, you, you interact with these agencies, the proposal that you do should really be meaningful and complementary to the agency mission, so then it means you really ought to understand the program, uh, not just through reading the literature, but by uh, you know, contacting the agency and the program and talking to uh, the, the, uh, the, the sponsored research managers there and really understand whether what you're doing fits. Uh, and then I would say you, you do something that, uh, or we do something commercially that's really important. Uh, there's an enhanced emphasis uh, you know, coming from Congress to the, you know, the, the key research agencies in the US government that they demonstrate the value of their research and, and an important way of demonstrating the value of that research is that it can be commercialized and that's what, you know, that's what we do. Uh, right. And uh, now, uh, so now I switch to the other side what, what do I get out of doing sponsored research with the agencies in addition to um, the other uh, you know, sort of business approaches that we have? Um, so I'd say um, the, uh, you know, so uh, a complementary research proposal, they, they, they take a long time to develop. You're not going to make a proposal and get an award and immediately have funding. You need to really think of this in the, uh, you know, sort of medium term kind of exercise where you understand the agencies, you make appropriate appro proposals, and then you work through the process of getting an award. Um, 
I think it's best if you really have something of some significance to pitch to them, right, that they can understand. And then, you know, I would say uh, I've learned that um, it's different from doing design, engineering, and analysis, and science, and proof of concept testing. So you really need a dedicated project manager to, to uh, take on and coordinate this activity with the, with the research agency. Uh, you know, for me, the value is the following. Um, um, you know, designing particle accelerators and, and advanced superconducting magnet systems and all of the associated technologies is really expensive. And um, by doing basic research with agencies, we can uh, sort of leverage that into uh, new intellectual property and, and new technology without raising funds, which you know, can dilute uh, control of the organization. Um, at the moment, I'm getting a patent about one per month awarded. And, um, and that's, um, you know, a, a huge effort in intellectual property. Uh, uh, you know, you have high performers in your company that were scientists or, or are really good engineers. And, uh, you know, you get to give them PI roles, and, you know, so it's something that they can be interested in. Um, in a strong scientific collaboration um, also often has connected with it uh, students, and uh, this gives you an opportunity to work with some of the best and brightest young minds, but also they could be your future employees, which you get to see uh, working in action and you know and how they how they interact with each other, how they collaborate, what their skills are, uh, in a much lower risk manner than hiring someone through a hiring process that then fails after several months and, and a lot of dollars spent bringing the person in house. Uh, and then you, in doing basic research, you develop advanced tools and, and benchmarks on your codes that you can, you can propagate through the company to do really quantitative design and analysis. Right, I think that is it. Thank you. Thank you. And just for the sake, I think we'll, we'll wait to the end for Q&A, if that's okay with everybody. <coughs> All right. Outstanding. Okay. So our next speaker is Jim Knighton, who is both co-founder and president of Avid Biotics, a seven-year-old company in South San Francisco, California, specializing in protein therapies against infectious disease and oncology. Prior to forming Avid Biotics in 2005, Mr. Knighton was president of Caliper Technologies, which he joined as CFO when the company was privately held. Okay, I think I'll just, for the sake of time, move through here. He has uh, broad experiences with a variety of companies, including DuPont, DuPont, Merck, and Chiron. Mr. Knighton holds an MBA from the Wharton School, an MS in genetics from the University of Pennsylvania, and a science undergraduate degree from the University of Notre Dame. And I have to say I'm a little disappointed by this, since it says that he's also founder and owner of the Knighton Family Vineyards, making a boutique premium Cabernet Sauvignon since 2004. I see no bottles. <laughs> so you, you can't actually get them. They're so good that they're, they're hard to get. So but for right? today only. Okay. <laughs> All right. Right. Special. Well, maybe at the end we, we, so we can ask some questions about them. Jim. Thanks. No. Um, I am wearing a tie, and I am in fundraising mode. So if you want to talk about that or wine afterwards, by all means. Um, as Tony mentioned, I used to be a CFO years ago, about a decade ago, of a couple of companies uh, in my background. So this is going to be a little bit more financially oriented on how university collaborations and non-dilutive financing has impacted uh, what is no longer a startup. Um, uh, three of us started this thing uh, almost eight years ago now, and one of our co-founders was is an academic, uh, Jeff Miller. On, um, UCLA. So we've been intimately involved with UCLA in the founding technology and since that time we've been very involved in a number of university collaborations that have helped us advance the company and you'll see what we think is a relatively unique way. We're focused on, we actually have two, second one was relatively uh, recent, two platform technologies 
our lead technology is a platform for infectious disease, going after drug-resistant bacteria, specifically in the microbiota. So that's what we've gotten. The technology that co-founded Avid Biotics was actually a protein engineering technology um, that Jeff has discovered, and uh, we patented this, and along with UCLA have, have a fairly large patent estate. And this platform has application in human therapeutics, animal health, and food safety, each area of which we have had university involvement. So I can't understate the importance of the collaborations to us, and indirectly, not only from a technological standpoint, but also from the standpoint that it's helped us raise other funding from other sources. So yeah. don't ever underestimate that collaboration. It may not be a lot of money coming to you, from the university, or even through STTRs, and we'll talk about that in a minute, it certainly has helped us take that data we've generated with these universities, presented it to other investors, or more importantly, corporate collaborators, of which we have a number, um, to move the company forward. So we started out with three guys. We are now up to 15, and we have uh, issued IP, both in the US and in Europe, with both of our platforms. So I've mentioned that the beginnings of the company um, we're certainly university-based, and we the first thing we did when it was absolutely virtual, um, Jeff is not an employee of the company. He does sit on our board, obviously, and he chairs our SAB, um, which is populated by complete academic individuals. We negotiated a license with, with UCLA for that, and other ones we've had, collaborations along the way, have been with UCSD and a number of other universities. And just a side word, because if it doesn't come up in the Q&A, um, I also like Tony's list of issues when you detail collaborations with universities, but almost all those things also apply to corporate, corporate or industry, industry collaborations. They take too long. They, the contracts are, are, can be quite onerous. But what I have found on the university side it's not really university specific, it's licensing director or head of tech transfer at universities that make the difference. I mean, some of these people are very, very hard-nosed, and I'd almost rather negotiate with a venture capitalist than with these guys, um, almost. Uh, and then others are very, very easy. And I'll, I won't give you the names of the difficult ones, but I would say UCLA had a very well-organized group, and we got these, uh, that collaboration done fairly quickly. Other ones have insisted on phantom stock and all kinds of different elements to a collaboration that really do make things difficult. Um, a lot of our funding, I won't say the majority because you'll see the chart in a minute on how we have funded this company to date, has come from the NIH. Um, hopefully soon with the DOD, but there, I'd be hard pressed from seeing that Freemind has helped us with many of these grants. I can't think of any one of them in particular that doesn't include a university researcher or a collaboration we have with the university. So those are critical components to the applications themselves, and I think we've had a pretty good track record on getting the grants with the NIH we've tried for. It's certainly not perfect, um, but we are going back. Last, uh, not, second to last, I have customers and scientific advisory board, uh, consultants and scientific advisory board. Um, our SAB is totally academic. Uh, researchers in the area of infectious disease and immunotherapy for oncology, we have that second platform for that. Um, again, those universities and the work they've done in their labs for us um, and their expertise is, has also been invaluable. Interestingly, in our case, we make a protein that is very, is tailorable and targeted to very specific bacteria. We custom make these things for any bacterium we can want to kill. We virtually can kill any bacterium we target. And it touches no other bacterium in the environment. So it's highly precise. Our marketing pitch is precision medicine for infectious disease. Interestingly, the universities are actually approaching us, individual researchers, on custom making these proteins, we call them a medicine protein, for the research they're doing against a certain bug. Individuals involved in the, the involvement of bacteria and obesity, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, colon cancer, et cetera, et cetera. 
they all want to knock out specific bacteria. So we've come full circle with our university colleagues in that these um, individuals are now becoming our customers. So it has been from cradle, certainly not grave yet, hopefully, um, the university involvement has been absolutely critical. Uh, last slide, and I know we're running late. We've raised $23 million today. We have taken no venture capital money. Um, <laughs> that's not to say we won't. <laughs> I'm surprised. Why aren't you guys clapping? $25 million. Right? Absolutely. And, and so I can't underestimate. I know it's sounding like a broken record. But the university involvement has helped us do this. Um, and we have sold equity, but just to individuals. Two of the founders have put in a significant amount of money, and we have just accredited individuals coming through and doing this work, uh, putting in this money. Um, but over five and a half million dollars of that, that total have come from the NIH. Um, and without those university collaborations, there's no way we could get that done. Those university collaborations came up in strategic investments. In fact, DuPont was mentioned earlier. They're a strategic investor in us and are doing a lot of the work in food safety. Um, and a lot of that early work was done at, 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 through university collaboration. So if you're starting a new company, not only do you need this as a vehicle to advance technology and do some very good raw science, um, but do not underestimate the short-term and long-term impact of these collaborations on financing the company. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so our next presenter is Dr. Eric Patzer, who is one of the founders of Aridus? Aridus Pharmaceuticals, and has been president since its inception in 2005. Dr. Patzer has been a biopharmaceutical development for over 30 years, beginning in Genentech, and working on many of their early recombinant protein and monoclonal antibody products, such as Herceptin and Fulmazine. During his 15 years at Genentech, he attained the position of vice president of product development he left to, to join Averon as VP for development and led the live attenuated influenza vaccine flu mist project during the early clinical development. Following its acquisition by Metamune, Dr. Patsa founded Aridus with Dr. Vu Trung to develop new non-antibiotic therapeutics for infectious diseases. Okay, with that, Eric. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk uh, less about money today than uh, I'm going to, I'd like to talk more about relationships. Uh, but we've raised $37 million in, in grant funding and research collaborations. About three quarters of that is through the NIH. So it's been, uh, and we haven't raised any, any private equity either, uh, just to give, it, give it an example. A um, little background on the company. So we're also focused in infectious diseases. So we've dealt a lot with the NIAID and DMID uh, groups at NIH. Um, but, uh, and, and really we're, what we're trying to do, all of our products are focused in trying to get around the issue of antibiotic resistance that we've all heard so much about uh, recently in, in a variety of different ways. A lot of the portfolio are mono, anti, uh, or monoclonal antibodies against bacterial targets. So um, we founded the company though with an underlying formulation technology that allowed us to develop uh, we, uh, temperature stable biomolecules. So we could make temperature stable vaccines, uh, bacteria, uh, uh, viruses, subunit vaccines, monoclonal antibodies that were stable for up to a year outside the refrigerator. Uh, they were stable at 37 degrees and, and even up to 45 degrees centigrade for uh, several months. So um, it was, a, it was a, it's a broadly applicable technology that really helped us then to be able to apply that to a number of other products and to collaborate. But we didn't want to be, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, we didn't want to be a, uh, just a, uh, a technology platform. We wanted to in-license products. And that's really the, the, what I want to tell you about today, our in-licensing of products and developing those through a grant funding mechanism. And uh, I'm going to give you two examples. One is the Arison project, and the other is uh, thanks. So the uh, Aricin, that's a monoclonal antibody to, to Pseudomonas, and the second one is going to be the, the, what we call the Panacin project, which is a broad-spectrum small molecule. 
So, uh, the, is there a way to make this big? Yes. Victor, can we do that? Yes. Big. Uh, that's sure. And then I can just full screen. No. Oh, so we've got a full screen. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's going to be a view. Well, this isn't PowerPoint, though. Yeah. No, it's, I know it's a PDF. Okay. Well, yeah. someone with greater technological window ability. window view full screen mode. Hey. That's why. That's why I'm a chemist and he's an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we said we wanted to license products that we could apply our technology to, and um, so we we identified uh, this monoclonal antibody. It was from Brigham and Women's Hospital. There was a published paper on it, and we also had uh, some people that we knew that that said, "Hey, this is a technology you should take a look at." First thing we did was check the university website to make sure it was the, the technology was still available and then called up the licensing office again to do the same thing to make sure they hadn't they hadn't either hadn't done a deal or were too far along to consider other uh, companies like us the second call then was to the inventor to talk to to in this case it was uh, dr jerry peer at brigham and women's hospital and talk a little bit more about the, for the project understand the science talk science with them, and the third step was to get on a plane and go there, because it's really important, we believe, to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the inventor and the licensing office to be able to really establish a relationship with them. Secondly is to talk to them about why why should they partner with Aaron? So they could go to Merck or Pfizer or somebody or a big biotech company. What did we offer them that uh, might be attractive to them other than an interest in their technology? And so the, what, we, what we were able to talk to them about is we had a technology, as I just described, that could stabilize their monoclonal antibody. Also, he was very interested in respiratory infections, pneumonia in particular, cystic fibrosis, and we talked about taking our technology and also developing an inhaled antibody. Ultimately, we decided not to go down that pathway, but, but it was something that was intriguing and it was an add-on to his technology. And uh, the third, the, the second thing was we had a lot of product development experience. I've got a lot of product uh, development experience. My co-founder, Boutrong, in the audience here. Um, by the way, the, when I say we developed all this formulation technology, that's the royal, royal we, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, so we could, we could also say we know how to do this, right? We've taken these products through before. Next, uh, what we did is we established, we, we applied, well, once we, so we, we negotiated the license. Uh, well, it's, it, uh, Brigham and Women's is, is probably more on the difficult side to, to negotiate with. Fortunately, we had someone that had been in a university licensing office that was licensing out technology. He was now on our side, so he helped, helped us understand what it was that, that's important to the university. Then we, so we wrote a grant. Uh, an STTR grant, which uh, is like an SBIR, but it's a, it's a third of it typically goes to the university, two thirds to the, the company. And there, there are three advantages. Um, we could take advantage that Dr. Peer had an established uh, track record and a, and a reputation in the field, and in this case, anti pseudomonas uh, antibodies, vaccines. Secondly, uh, we, could, we could use that as a mechanism to support his lab. And uh, thirdly, um, it, it, it got us access to his lab, so a lot of the in vitro work he had done, the animal uh, the models that he had developed, we then could get access to, to that as well. We completed that uh, grant, and we were going on to a phase two STPR grant. And um, one of the things, uh, so we were ready to, to move into manufacturing, process development, GLP tox studies, and we sat down and talked to him. And, and what I'm, the, 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 what I want to, the reason I'm telling you that is, you know, it's important to maintain that relationship with, with the investigator. So we talked to him, we explained what we wanted to, to do with the project, and he agreed he wasn't the right person to, uh, to collaborate with on that. And so we changed uh, the university collaboration for the phase two STTR, and we, we, uh, we set up a collaboration with the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Turns out, they're one of a very few uh, university affiliates that have a contract manufacturing organization affiliated with this Mass Biologics is the name of the group, and we were able to, to, uh, to uh, do GMP manufacturing uh, through this STTR uh, mechanism. And so we've, we've done scale-up, we 
did the manufacturers, made the actually the GMP material. Uh, we're completing the uh, PK and the, there was the GLP TUC study. We're about to file the IND in the next couple of months. So, what do we do now? What's the, what's the, is there a mechanism then to go into clinical trials? And there is. It's completely separate. You can't. You typically can't go, use SBIR or STTR to fund clinical trials. But there are separate mechanisms to do that within NIH. So we got back on the plane. We flew down to NIH and made a presentation to a, a, a quite a large group at, of uh, NI, NIAID and DMID representatives at the NIH. They were very excited about uh, this, this antibody project. And uh, went back and forth a little bit with them trying to figure out what's the right funding mechanism. And we just got a verbal confirmation last week that through their vaccine and treatment evaluation groups, there's about seven of those that are throughout the uh, United States, they're going to fund the phase one trial for this, uh, this, uh, this uh, antibody as well. So it's a, just a story to give you a sense of the way we, we manage this. And we've gotten all the way through now to a phase one clinical trial through non-delivered sources. Um, okay, I'm probably too long, right? I'll give you a quick second one. So this is this is not quite as linear as the is the, the last the, the one I just presented to you. It's we in licensed, it's a it's a small molecule, it's an anti broad spectrum antimicrobial that we licensed in from the University of Iowa. We again we became aware of this technology through meetings and some publications. We met with the in, inventor. Uh, also, you know, of course, met with the uh, University of Iowa licensing group. It's, it's called uh, the University of Iowa Research Foundation. And uh, again, took a very similar tactic. Uh, how could our technology help with this, uh, with this product? Um, and, and again, we could use our inhalation technology, making stable liquids or stable powders, and, uh, and forming. And in this case, we, we did develop an inhaled therapy for this, for this product for the treatment of cystic lung infections and cystic fibrosis patients. That was an area that uh, we, we had an interest in, but also the inventor had, a, had a, a, an interest in, a personal interest. Um, and uh, so it, it fit very well with what he wanted to see happen with this, with this product. Um, we uh, also had a phase one SPIR grant with him. Uh, for uh, Since I don't have a lot of time, uh, we, we couldn't do a phase two with him. But we were recently awarded a five-year contract with the NIH to take this project all the way through to uh, phase one clinical trial, uh, developing an inhaled formulation, um, and not for cystic fibrosis, but for lung infections, respiratory infections, for, with a variety of different bacteria. Um, and separately, we set up a collaboration with, with uh, Walter Reed and the DOD, got funding for a topical formulation. I can't, I don't have time to tell you about that, but if you ask me questions, I'll tell you a bit more about that as well. And finally, just some observations. Most of these are obvious. I think the point I was trying to make today is, you know, it's really important to develop relationships with the inventors, with program officers at the NIH. We, we also went to the NIH and talked to them. What are they, what are they looking for in university officials? And I'll leave it at that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Last presentation before the Q and A is from Dr. Scott Thatcher, who's CEO of Orphigen, founded a, a company he founded in 2001 to identify ligands to novel potential drug targets. He enabled Orphigen to raise greater than six million dollars in grant funding and led the company to its first strategic partnership in 2008. Scott is a co-founder and board member of is it IO Therapeutics? Uh -huh. IO Therapeutics and president of the San Diego en Entrepreneurs Exchange. Scott was previously a research investigator at Allergan and on the medical faculty at Texas A&M. He holds a BS in physics from Stanford and did his PhD work at Harvard. So with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. I, I uh, heartily agree with the conclusion that you would like to go as far as possible without VC funding, but this is a conclusion that I've reached uh, only after years of, of trying. Um, the concept, of, first let me explain what we do very briefly and then, then I'll put this in the context of funding and then lastly in the context of the university uh, relationships that we have, which as mentioned are extremely important. So what do we mean by first-in-class drugs? Um, 
Our view of drug discovery is that there's a fairly limited number of targets, at least in the human body, for treatment of uh, chronic uh, disease. And of course, many more used for treatment of infectious disease. And so there, there, and there are thousands of drugs out there. So a real opportunity exists in bringing new targets into the, excuse me, into the drug discovery pipeline. And these have the potential for transformative therapy that pharma is willing to pay for. So there, I'm, I'm suggesting what we do. We go after novel targets, in this case, small molecule uh, uh, potential drug targets from the nuclear receptor family that includes the androgen and estrogen and PPAR gamma receptors. And then our ultimate goal is to, to find an academic partner. A lot of what goes on in the industry is follow-on discovery. And so we're trying to find that first arrow to a new target. Um, we think there is significant uh, potential there. Throw away what you know about having to get to phase two. About 50% of partnering deals occur before a drug uh, uh, is tested in human. And in the discovery stage, those upfronts are significant, especially when you consider the amount of money that you have to put in to get there and the possibility of getting non-dilutive funding from the NIH and other sources. At the same time, industry is interested in having a first-to-market asset. So what we had to figure out was to make a discovery engine at the early stage where VCs clearly were not going to invest. So let me just tell you what we've done and, and then a little bit how we've done it. We have an autoimmune disease program on a very hot target that we partnered in 2008 with Japan Tobacco. That's gone into phase one. We have a lead program in circadian disruption. All of these were seeded by uh, NIH SBIR pro uh, funding. Uh, other, other programs that are in the pre-lead uh, stage that we, we hope to partner later on in retinal disease and endocrine cancers. And then to round out the discovery platform, since we've discovered we have a skill set that applies to these novel targets, we're going after additional ones to try to elucidate what their therapeutic potential is. So non-dilutive funding and uh, academia has been, been essential uh, to generate ideas. So we're in a constant uh, conversation with our academic uh, partners. And to get the company off the ground, we've got five core SBIR grants uh, within the first three, four years. Uh, many of these ideas were developed uh, not just from the primary literature, but ongoing discussion with academic consultants. Um, the discovery that uh, of ROR gamma and TH17 cells, for those of you familiar with the autoimmune space, know that that was a a pivotal point in, in focusing drug discovery effort uh, is something we became aware of in 2005 and we had already been screening this target. So that enabled us to get an early partnership with Japan Tobacco. And now we have uh, deep industry academia advisory groups with, with the close down of many research operations uh, in, in uh, pharma, it's been possible for us to recruit very talented people to advise us on drug development. So there, there are cautionary notes that, that come purely from my own experience. The first is that most tech transfer is open source. So remember that, it's, it's out there. And second is, you wanna develop technology inside if at all possible. There are significant risks uh, to becoming a broker, hoping you take something from one lab to another lab to generate something that's gonna create investment. It's slow. So you want to create an internal discovery engine, and I think that's what many of my colleagues uh, have done. And then you want to collaborate rather than uh, contract, because as a small company getting uh, NIH funding, you don't have a lot of money to be able to drive uh, uh, and, and contract inside uh, a university uh, laboratory. So um, next, let me point out some of the successful partnerships. A theme that I'm going to get back to is many of these have been what I call open source. So we use the NIH roadmap screening process uh, uh, program to go after a couple of targets where we were having trouble getting good hits. These hits uh, that were generated through Scripps Florida were published, put on the web. Nevertheless, that was useful to us because we had the overall picture of where those targets would go, so we were able to take that information 
and exploit it further internally. So this is why I'm a big, big fan of open source work when you can do it. We do contract work with the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. We have a collaboration ongoing with a foreign company, a foreign uh, university in Barcelona that's creating um, uh, reagents that, that we, we would not know how to create and we've done, done work elsewhere in the country. So open source collaboration um, is a theme that I'm starting to embrace. When you're impecunious, which means you don't have much money, you have to be creative. And uh, so if you have a difficult to solve problem internally, collaborate. Now, on our agenda is trying to influence the academic laboratory to recognize the problem we have rather than the problem of getting a publication, which the academic investor has. But it's also a struggle with the people I've got internally who suffer from the other NIH syndrome, not invented here, which is an unconscious or conscious bias that we bring with us from our large industry experience that you really don't want to give anything away. And of course, that's a mistake. So we share early technology, the potential for, public, uh, for publication, still untried, or uh, uh, it's something that I should say we're trying but have not succeeded at, is to find foundations and NIH to co-fund these open source uh, uh, projects and the common interest can enrich our technology and uh, the academic lab often is willing to work with you because they're struggling as well. So it's a classic uh, sharing of ideas. So finally, um, uh, as, as some of my uh, colleagues up here have shown, a private company is an extraordinary setting for technology innovation. Um, you can create a discovery engine that tolerates failure and can incorporate ideas from academia at every level, and that's really valuable. Um, academic input is often given gener uh, generously. We've only had one or two cases where somebody kind of left the fold and wanted to compete and, you know, they, they really weren't that successful. So I consider that only a modest risk. And I put dealing with the Ivory Tower Tech Transfer Office uh, low down on the list. We've not had terrible problems, at least when we had a very clear idea of where we wanted to go. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we've got about a half hour left questions from the audience before the break. And so um, Eric, Scott, Timothy, and, and Jim will, and myself will be pleased to answer any questions you have. I don't think we have microphones, but it's a small enough room. If you have a question, raise your hand and we'll direct it to the right person. Any questions? So while you guys are formulating questions, let me make maybe a couple observations that I think things that we, we touched on, but I, I'd like to point out. Email is probably the worst thing that's ever happened to university industry collaborations. Because when I started in this business, and I'm, I'm not that old, I'm not that young, but I'm not that old, um, we would actually get on a plane, right? And meet with people. And we would, I'd always fly in the night before and have dinner to start kind of our discussions. And I had signatory authority at the universities that I worked at. So that means I could stay as long as needed to sign an agreement which was very powerful because, you know what, most companies can't do that, unless they're a small company, right? But a big company typically couldn't do that, and they were impressed by the fact that I would say I'll stay as long as I need to, to to get an agreement in place. So this is still about people. It's not the university of blank or this large company. It's about Bill or Jane or Susan. And in fact, if Bill, Jane, or Susan is your academic collaborator and they move, you're going to move your relationship typically if that's the person that you work with. So. I think this is still about people, and we shouldn't lose, lose sight of, of that. And one thing that wasn't really touched on, but I think is an important factor when you think about collaborations with, with academic researchers, is they are prolific grant writers. And if you're a small company and you've never done an SBR application, and, and obviously Freemind and is out there to, to help you orient and learn about the ins and outs, but as it relates to specific grant applications, one of the best things you can do is collaborate with an academic partner because they know how to write grant applications. The other piece of advice which I would give you is go to the NIH website and volunteer to review an SBIR proposal because they're always looking for reviewers. You want to learn about how to get funded? Go sit on a review panel. because, for, And I, I'm sure all of us up here have been on those. 
People who are funded are not funded because they wrote the best proposals. They wrote a proposal that didn't have a fatal flaw to it. So it's a process, it's a, it's a game of a survivor, survivor, right? So we eliminate, you know, you start with 50 proposals, you're going to fund five or 10, and half of them aren't good. They're not even close to quality. So you eliminate those. That leaves you 25 left. Five are outstanding. So you're going to fund those. And then there's five slots, five awards that typically will can be funded over the next 20. And so you're basically going through process of elimination by scaling down scores to get you to that, that fund pay line. So if you haven't done that, I would encourage you to, to sit on a review panel. They'll pay your expenses. And I, I don't remember, what is it, $200 a day, the honorarium? I know it doesn't go very far, but at least to cover your costs. So something to think about. So um, any additional comments from the panelists? If, if we don't have any questions, any, anything? Eric? Absolutely. Absolutely. Questions from the audience? Anything anybody would like to interject? Yes. Please identify yourself. You don't mind? Yeah, so so the question was about managing expectations, um, and that's a challenge. Um, w what I would point out is not all universities are the same. And, and so public universities now are under incredible pressure to show an economic development mission. And, and, and MIT, who's a member of our group, and I love MIT, and I love Stanford, they're also a member of our group, um, they have a different mission than the University of Texas at San Antonio, or, or San Jose State, or Cal Berkeley, or UCSD, or University of Florida. And so they tend to be, within their organizations, many state universities have a small business development center that's in the business school. They'll have the manufacturing extension partnership that's in the engineering school. And so when a small business comes to them, it's a loss lead for them. Um, so I used to oversee research operations at several schools. I can tell you that the university invests typically a lot more in time and energy than they get out through the funding that would come through an STR and SBIR, especially if it's a phase one. But if it's great for a faculty member and it helps them get their R01 or their NSF center or their DOD center or whatever, and they intellectually, intellectually want to do it, it's great. So I think it's trying to manage those expectations both from the university side, but also from the company side. And it's finding the, the right place that you're willing to work with. You know, there are companies that have a select list of schools that they work with, and they don't go outside that list. And it's because they've reached a comfort level and how to work with those schools. Um, so it's just like, you know, putting in a garden. You know, I, every year in the spring, we, we, I get excited about putting in our garden, and we plant, you know, oregano and strawberries and tomatoes. and some of those things pan out, right? And some of them get eaten by, by, by animals or they get diseased. And, and the metaphor is this. Well, I, obviously, it's not very good if I have to explain it. And the metaphor is this. You might have to try working with three or four different schools and find one that provides you the payoff. So OK, scratch that off my list of metaphors. OK, other questions from the audience? It's a great question. Yes, sir? No, you have to identify yourself and tell, tell us your organization. Okay. And I'm wondering whether there's ever a point where um, it's worth finding an academic collaborator just to have them on a grant that you would otherwise buy yourself and have them Panelists? Go ahead, Scott. Absolutely. Yeah. You need credibility. And uh, on the way, you want to convince the academic collaborator that you know what you're doing. And so why do you still have to do it? Or maybe that you don't know. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. You want, I, I think in our case, when, uh, yeah. You're on. This is going to blast. Yeah. 
In our case, when we were going after phase one grants for completely new targets, we, it, it really helped to get additional credibility. And I think the effort paid off in other ways. Anybody else on the panel? So it was not totally cynical. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, I would comment that um, folks in universities sort of view themselves as unique and special, and, and sometimes they're not. Um, and so um, they're still, if they've got a, a proven track record, um, they still can be very helpful to getting you started. And so you have to just uh, find one that matches. Go ahead. Uh, you know, the other thing you get is access to their laboratory, and uh, you know, maybe they have some specialized uh, assays mm -hmm. or animal models or something like that that you can take advantage of as well. Okay. Other questions? Okay, in the back. <laughs> I answer that? Sure. It's a little known fact that entrepreneurs are inventors also and have unique and interesting ideas and therefore it should not be surprising that we don't just exist to commercialize local university technology and I hate to be so blunt I tell this to people all the time and that we would look uh, across the country and across the world for the ideal person to live with. So it really just demonstrates that Northern California like San Diego where I come from has a critical mass of entrepreneurs, people with ideas, and universities, but they don't necessarily have to have a one-to-one -one relationship. I actually think there's another reason, and that is it depends on the technology and where that individual is that you need. I mean, sure, we'd like to partner with Stanford and UC and you know UCSF, but if that, ex if that activity is at Wash U, that's where we're going. Yeah. So, so let me just interject and then we'll take the next question. So we have a project at, at, at the UIDP, the group I represent, where we developed this guidebook for active researchers from academia and industry to work across the aisle. And this came out of a discussion that Kimberly Clark and Georgia Tech had, a, a presentation where they had two bench scientists talk about they developed a relationship. Now, Georgia Tech and Kimberly Clark and Roswell are about 20 miles apart. They go to an MRS meeting in another part of the country. They meet, they talk, they talked about all the challenges about working together, but ultimately it turned out that they developed a collaboration. And I remember I asked the guy from Kimberly Clark, why did you do this? Why did you spend 18 months getting an agreement in place with Georgia Tech? Why did you do all this stuff? And he looked at me and he pointed to the guy from Georgia Tech and he said, because I think this guy is probably the best in the world at what he's doing, and I think he can help my company make money. What a, what a great way of saying it, right? And even though they were only 20 miles apart and they had never met until they went to a professional society meeting, they ultimately wound up finding a way to work together because it made sense. Sir. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, who wants to take that question? I, I, think, I think I probably started that with my comment, and I, I, won't, I can't list the ones that are trouble. But I can give you a bit of the phenotype. So, some of these tech transfer directors think they're CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, and they, it's an attitude. I mean, we went around for six months about developing a phantom stock to keep the guy happy. Um, and it, a phantom stock is, is the university can't buy stock in the company. And they're not going to write you a check for the stock or the equity you have. So you basically make up um, a, a shadow equity. And I mean that only in the term, it, it, the way it boils down is when you go public as a company, they'll get some ownership of it. 
It's of no value prior to a liquidation event. Yeah, it's typically done as a warrant. Yeah, yeah it must have a research foundation. So, so. Yeah, it's it's not it's not even doesn't even have a value on it. So it's not like there's a strike price, but they get an X percent of the value of your IPO. I mean, incredibly costly. Um, so they see their, and I, I can't criticize that they see their operations at the university as somewhat of a commercial entity, some, some type of commerce, but these individuals tend to be more concerned with the, you know, making a lot of money on the back end uh, than they are dealing with the underlying technology and just taking what is relatively normal as a set of terms. Um, some universities don't deal with phantom stock at all, and that's, that's much easier. All right, um, I'd like to also comment on that. Uh, um, some universities have in their mission statement to, to put what they're doing in the research labs out in, in, in the real world. Uh, so, for example, uh, at MIT, we that's that's part of the mission, as a as a, you know a professor and scientist and, and principal investigator. And so, um, and um, I think that uh, something like five thousand companies and sixteen thousand patents so far at MIT. So, look at um, you know the the mission statement for the university. Um, um, you know, I, I'm from MIT, but I, I like the infrastructure that MIT has for, for for commercialization of patents. I've sort of been on both sides of it, both creating some and licensing some. Uh, Stanford also. Uh, it's it's not a surprise that they these two and, and, and maybe John Hopkins are the leaders because they really have um, worked out uh, intellectual property and who owns what in a research agreement. And and uh, uh, and uh, so I'd say I I like I like working with both of them and they and they have just tremendous patent portfolios. Yeah, the the one thing I wanted to mention uh, I didn't talk about it today, but um, the NIH is a, is also it's not a university, but it's a great place to license technology and from the intramural labs you're talking about. With that, you're talking about from the intramural labs. Yeah, from the intramural yeah. labs they have uh, you know they have. Uh, good websites, but also they have a different, uh, a slightly different attitude. Certainly, they want to recoup their expenses and, and make money if they can. But 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 their primary goal is to really see that technology uh, become commercialized. And so they're, uh, we found them, you know, very very uh, easy to work with um, and uh, very supportive. Well, and I, if I can extend that, I think if you look at the national labs you know, beyond NIH, also have a mission now. I think there's variance in the quality of how they interact with companies, but but you can go to national labs, especially for the high-end instrumentation stuff. Is the national labs are very valuable. Other questions? Okay, you get one more question. You get go for it. You, you're talking about from from grants. Or from, You're talking about the internal distribution policies? Okay. That, that, that's, yeah. Okay. You guys want to take a shot at that? I mean, I think there's great variance based upon the, the technology, the field, the commercializability. I mean, in-house, universities are typically anywhere from a third to half. And some of them have scalars, so it's 50% of the first 10,000, or 10,000, and then 50% of the next 100, and, and various. Yeah, it, it tend, the ones we've been involved with, they, they tend to be dollar amounts, um, realizing that it can take a very long time between the time you sign a discovery type deal with a base technology with a university, and then there's product sales. In our line of work, that can be decades. But um, so you do see certain milestone payments set. As a dollar, not as a, as a, not as, and we're talking thousands to tens of thousands. We're not talking hundreds of millions, um, usually. Uh, and then there's a royalty side. I mean, these terms look very much like any industry deal, uh, minus the equity. Um, so there, there'll be 
very low single digits or fractions of a percentage that they'll get on pri final product sales, or it'll be a percentage of what you, the biotech licensee is, are receiving from your large pharma partner, for example, in the end. So it's, it's, they're not huge numbers. Now, if you get billion dollar drugs, they turn out to be very large numbers, but um, if, if they're not want, onerous. If you want an education in University Tech Transfer, Autumn, which is their professional society, is holding their annual meeting in San Francisco in mid-February. So it's autumn.net if you want to check it out. And if you go to one of those meetings, you'll, you'll gain a lot of education if you haven't worked at the universities in the past. Yeah, it, um, it also depends on whether you're licensing exclusively or, or, or not exclusively. So uh, um, I, I think um, of order 3 to 5% of the product value uh, yeah, for, for exclusive and maybe uh, half a percent or, or less even for, for not exclusive. Okay, additional questions? Okay, well, if there are no additional questions, I'll ask the panel if they have any additional comments. And if not, I'd like to please join me in thanking them for the presentation. I want to thank you all. I know we'll. We'll be around for a few more minutes, and like I said, I have a little bit of propaganda if anybody wants some information about collaborating with the academic sector. So thank you. Yeah.